Praise the Lord. This is Pastor Samuel Morris, pastor of Fountain of Living Waters Church in Queens, New York. You're watching The Oasis, our television outreach program. Praise the Lord. Now, we all know what an oasis is. An oasis is a paradise in the middle of the desert. Amen. What are the two outstanding features of the oasis? The trees and the water. The trees to shade you from the blazing hot sun that was beating down and drying the life out of you and good, refreshing, life-giving water. Amen. Glory to God. When you got born again and came into Jesus, you, you came out of the desert and you came into the oasis. But you know, too many Christians uh, come in and get the shade from the tree. Yes, they're, they're going to heaven when they die. Amen. But they never partake of the life-giving waters. They don't get the vibrancy of the Christian life that's supposed to be lived today in the earth. Just like um, a, a traveler in the desert who's hungry, who's thirsty, looks for the oasis, and it's a sign of hope for him. Amen. We as Christians, our life is supposed to be so refreshing and it's supposed to be so vibrant that the people who are still in sin, amen, and if that's you still in sin, we're going to give you the answer to that before the program is over, so stick with us. Amen. Your life as a Christian is supposed to be so vibrant and inviting to the people still in the desert of sin that they want to come in and make Jesus the Lord of their life. Amen. As we go into the word of God, as we study, we are going to learn how to walk in the fullness of everything God has for us. We're going to drink the water. You know, when I was in school, we had a little saying about good, better, best. Never let it rest till your good is better and your better best. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy that God wants us to have days of heaven right here on the earth. So when you get born again, uh, you come under the trees, you get in the oasis, you drink the water, things are supposed to get good and they get I know this is bad English, but they get gooder and gooder and gooder and better and better and better. Then when we leave this life and go to the next life, amen, then we get the best. Amen. I was watching a program the other day, a nature program, and I was watching the gigantic whales down to the little tiny krill, the little shrimp, the crab, starfish, all the different colored fish. And it came to me with such an impact that the God who created all of this lives inside of me. How can any situation, how can any problem in life defeat me when I have the creator of everything living inside of me? Amen. Let's go to the word of God. Now, when the teaching is over, don't go away because I'm going to be right back. We're going to talk a little bit more. Amen. As the program is playing, you're going to see contact information. Amen. Uh, you can order these broadcasts um, in any format you like. Um, again, use the contact information. Get in contact with us. Amen. Let's go into the word of God. God bless. This is Samuel Morris. Welcome to this week's edition of the Oasis. As always, let's open up with a word of prayer, get back into the word of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise once again for the privilege and opportunity to fellowship with you around your word. We thank you that I have utterance, I have lips that are anointed by the Holy Ghost, a tongue that speaks of the heavenly mysteries that you have reserved for the church in this end time. I thank you that my listeners have ears to hear, hearts to perceive and understand and to walk in the fullness of your revelation for today. We thank you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. Now, as always, um, contact information will appear periodically um, across your screen. Amen. Glory to God. Now, we're in the midst of talking about speaking in tongues. Amen. Exactly um, the purpose of it. Amen. A little of the, uh, for want of a better word, the mechanics of it. Um, amen. Not that anybody can teach you how to speak in tongues. Amen. But um, what are tongues for? Amen. Or, you know, we know um, that they are the initial evidence or a sign that you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. But is that it? Is it just something um, that happens when you're feeling good and you feel the Spirit moving and you're in a high service? Amen. Um, at church and, you know, you just bubble over and it comes out in tongues. Is that all tongues are? No, my friend. Tongues, as everything God does, God gives everything for a benefit and it's for our benefit. Understand, my friend, everything that God does 
He does it for our benefit because God is complete. He doesn't need anything. Everything that God does, he does it by his grace, by his gracious love, because he loves us and it's for our benefit. And tongues falls right into that category. We were looking um, at um, Acts the 10th chapter and we pointed out that Cornelius and his household were filled with the Holy Spirit before they were baptized. Amen. Glory to God. So that kind of puts a hole in the people's doctrine who says that you can't be filled with the Holy Spirit unless you're baptized. That's not so, my friend, because we see an instance of it happening in the Bible. Now, to make it fit their doctrine, people will try to explain it away, say, well, that was just a special thing. That was one time, blah, 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 blah. Blah, blah, but the Bible doesn't say that. Amen. The Bible just says that as Peter spoke, the Holy Ghost fell and they started speaking in tongue and giving glory and giving praise to God. Amen. Now, one question that I want to, um, that we didn't talk about last week, and I want to bring it up before we um, leave here. Um, we looked at um, Mark 16 and 17, and uh, 16 and 16, 16 and 17. And again, as always, the correct scripture appears um, underneath me while I'm talking. Amen. So you're interested in looking it up. The correct um, scripture location just appeared on your screen. Amen. Um, Jesus said these signs will follow. Now, uh, we've been um, doing, um, this is about, uh, about the fourth or fifth broadcast in that we've been doing this um, particular topic of focusing on speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. Now, in the first um, session along this progression, we pointed out that one of the things that tongues were, that tongues are a sign. Amen. And what does a sign do? A sign gives direction. It shows that things have changed. We point out how highway signs tell you, amen. Um, speed limit was 65, but it's getting ready to drop back down to 55. Amen. Or road hazard ahead or men working ahead to use, um, highway type signs. So signs indicate something signs are for instruction signs are for direction. So it says here in acts 10, um, 45 and they of the circumcision were, which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy ghost for or because they heard them speak with tongues and magnifying God. Okay. Now the question is what I want to pose to you is how did they know they were magnifying God? Amen. Now, for those of you who are with us, and again, if you weren't contact information appears across the screen, give us a call and we'll see that you get the revelant um, broadcast. But we showed how in the second chapter of the book of Acts, we saw that the word tongues means languages. So when they spoke in tongues for the first time, there were people in Jerusalem from all over the world and the known world at that time anyway, and they heard the people speaking in their own languages and their own dialects, the glory of God. Amen. And it goes in the list of acts. It goes into a, a extensive list about all the different countries and nations that were represented there on the day of Pentecost and how each one heard heard them praising and magnifying God in this, their own particular language. Then when Peter got up and spoke, I believe he spoke in, um, the one language that everybody was speaking, probably Latin or Greek. Amen. Uh, and he said in Latin or Greek for the whole audience to hear and understand what each individual was hearing said about God in their own language. Because Peter goes through about how um, the prophets and David said and Moses said and this one and that one said. And I believe that this is what um, the people were hearing in tongues. And then Peter came out and said it in the one language that the whole group understood. Amen. So here, I believe the same thing happened. Um, Cornelius was Italian. Amen. Um, probably spoke Latin. Amen. That was probably his um, native tongue. Amen. Because he was of the Italian band. Peter and the rest of them, they spoke Aramaic or Hebrew, uh, type of Hebrew. Amen. Um, 
So um, now again, because Rome had conquered um, the land of Israel and the known world at this time, amen, everybody had to learn the language of the conqueror, which was Latin. So definitely Peter, James, John, the Jews that went down there, they spoke and understood Latin, amen. And Cornelius, um, he understood Latin, probably didn't understand Greek or Aramaic. The scripture doesn't go on to say, but because he was a centurion of the Italian band, he was the conqueror, as it were. It wasn't incumbent on him necessarily to learn the language of the conquered. Amen. Maybe if he wanted to know what they were saying when they spoke in their language, it, it, when they thought he couldn't understand it, he would learn Hebrew or Aramaic. Amen. But as far as having to communicate? No. Amen. It was the responsibility of the conquered to make sure that they understood the conqueror or they would lose their life. They could lose their head. They lose their property. All right. So when Cornelius started to speak in tongues, I would venture to say he, he a good chance he was speaking in perfect Hebrew. Amen. Uh, uh, he was speaking in a language that he didn't understand because it says here that Peter um, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify, glorify, give praise to God. Now, we're going to learn a little later, if not in this broadcast, maybe one or two down the line, how when one of the things that tongues does, it gives perfect praise. You are not praising God um, to the ultimate height, unless you are praising and worshiping him in tongues. But we'll get to that later. Amen. Glory to God. That is the epitome of worship and praise is when it's done in tongues. Amen. Glory to God. So I believe that here as Cornelius is speaking, one of the signs, one of the reasons that they knew that this was a legitimate tongue that came from God is because here is this Italian man and he's probably never learned um, whatever language he was speaking, he didn't learn it, but these men were able to tell that whatever language it was, amen, that he was giving God perfect praise, amen. Now, another point, um, if he wasn't speaking Hebrew when he was speaking in tongues, whatever language he was speaking, God gave the um, apostle and the people that were with Apostle Peter, he gave them the interpretation of tongues. Why do I say that? Because it says here, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Uh, they heard them speaking with tongues, also magnifying God. Amen. That word and means and, but also a number of different things. So we could substitute those words in there. And if you have different translations of the Bible, it does that. All right. But the point I want to get to and the uh, reason I'm belaboring this is one of the um, jobs of tongues and which is still being used today in the church is that it is, it is a sign. It is a sign both to believers and to unbelievers. Amen. Glory to God. Um, we only limited as a sign that someone has been filled with the Holy Ghost, but it's much more than that, my friend. All right, let's turn to um, 1 Corinthians, amen, the 12th chapter. We are leaving the function of tongues as the initial sign that someone has been initiated um, into the fullness of the Holy Spirit, that they are filled with the Holy Ghost. We're leaving now the operations of tongues in that manner, all right? Now we're looking at tongues as a gift, all right? Now, I'm not going to read the whole of um, 1 Corinthians, but I'm going to read it enough so that you can get the flow of what the apostle is talking about. So you can get the exegesis in context as opposed to the eisegesis, which is out of context. Why is that important? Because we're going to get to a scripture, hopefully in this broadcast, if not this one, in the next one, that people use a verse in this chapter that people use to prove that tongues are not for today. Amen. And I want to show where they pick out a scripture out of context and use it to say something that the apostle was not referring to. And it actually goes against what the apostle was trying to say. Now, starting at verse one of um, 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. 
you know that you were Gentiles. So that lets us know that the Corinthian church was a Gentile church. So when Paul is talking to them, he might talk about things about the law, which they probably knew about and understood some tenets, but he was not telling them that they were under the law because they were not Jews. They were Gentiles. So the law had nothing to do with them, but that's, that's another issue. You know that you were Gentiles, were, past tense. No more in Christ, there's no more Jew nor Greek. There's no more Jew, Gentile, male, female, bond to free. Amen. Glory to God. You know you were Gentiles carried away with these dumb idols even as you led. Wherefore I give to you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse. And no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but are except by the Holy Ghost. Now, this is what we're talking about here in this chapter, so we have to keep it in context. Now, there are diversities or differences of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. All right. And there are diversities operate of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit, the gifts, is given to every man or woman, to everyone to profit with all or to profit the body. See, your gift, whatever your gift is, was not given to you for you. It was given to you for the body of Christ in general and for your local congregation in particular. Amen. Glory to God. You know, we're here and we're doing this broadcast and every Everything that we're doing runs by electricity. Okay, now, um, if you if you know know anything about the electric electrical grid, Amen. At least here in our area in New York, everything is above ground, Amen. So on the electric lines, ever so often you see a big box transformer, and if one of those boxes ever blow out, you have a funny smell and you lose power in that area. That's a, a step down transformer. It's a transformer. Okay, now I have in my house. Um, because this is the United States, we use 115 to 122 or so volts AC current at 60 cycles, 60 hertz. That's our power. Okay. Now, that's why those of you who might be from Africa, you get here and you bring appliances or something and they don't work. Or if you want to ship something back home to Africa or you want to ship something to the Middle East, you have to make sure that it's 110, 220, because over here we use the 110 over... Uh, 60 cycle over there in Europe, they use, um, 220, uh, 50 cycle. Amen. And if you ever bring something from over there and plug it in, there's a good chance you saw smoke coming out of the thing. And if you take something that was made to be used in the United States, amen. And you take it over to Africa or the mid East and you plug it in, there's a good chance you saw smoke. So if you're going to send stuff back home, you got to make sure that it works on the current that works at in your country. Amen. But the point I want to get to is that I am connected to the grid. All right. If the grid goes out, I lose power. However, I am not connected directly to the grid. What do I mean by that? Okay. I plug in my power of these lights or whatever. I plugged them into the wall. They go down into the basement and it goes through a circuit breaker. Amen. Now the circuit breaker is so if there's a short or something, or if you are at old the house, you have a fuse box it does the same thing, except the fuses have to be replaced. If they blow circuit breaker, um, unless they go bad, you just flip the switch and it cuts back on once you remove the fault. Amen. Some of you have the little outlets in your bathroom or in the kitchen, different places, um, called the ground fault outlet. Amen. You see the little buttons on there. And if you hit the button the wrong way, when you plug something in, you lose power. So that means right there at that outlet, there's a little circuit breaker in there. So if you plug something in that shorts out, instead of blowing that circuit breaker, the fuse for the whole line, it just cuts that outlet off until you unplug, amen, whatever is causing the problem. Anyway, 
But most people um, definitely have the fuse box or the circuit breaker, if not the little ground fault interrupter circuit in the, um, in the wall. All right, so I'm connected to the wall, and it goes down into the basement. It goes through the fuse box. It goes through the fuse box, and it's connected. We see the wires coming out of the house going up to a transformer. Okay, now on the other side of that transformer, it may not necessarily be... 120 volts is probably higher because what those transformers do, a little um, electronics, a little magnetism here, a little visiting of the electromagnetic spectrum. The reason we use AC power is because you can transmit AC over long distances without losing power. DC doesn't work like that. Um, if you've ever had the experience of trying to boost your car battery, and let's say that because of parking or whatever, um, the person who's trying to give you the boost can't get right up close. If you've ever tried to take two sections of um, of jumper wires. You get you got a pair of jumper wires and I got a pair of jumper wires and we try to tie them together over a long distance. The car, unless that other battery is very powerful and yours is not that bad, it's not gonna work. Why? Because what happens is, is that DC current is dropped along that wire. That wire has resistance and technically, for those of you who might be, who might work on the grid, might be aligning it, Linemen, it's called IR losses, current and resistant losses. So what happens as the DC cu um, current is coming down the line, amen, the resistance in the wire eats up the current. So by the time it gets to the end, if it started off, let's say 120 volts, before it goes too far, it won't be any volts because the wire eats it up. All right, but what happens with AC, and because of the way magnets work, you can start off at a very high voltage, amen, maybe 20,000 volts, and send it down the line. And then when it gets to the transformer, the transformer will do, will call, step it down. It will step it down to the 120 volts, and without getting too technical about it, because of the way current and voltage are related, current times voltage equals power, and the power is going to stay the same. When you raise the voltage, the current drops down. So you have a high voltage with very little current coming down the wire from the power station till it gets right outside your door or in your local neighborhood, and then they stop, step down the voltage to 120, and the current will go up so that it, you have enough to, um, to uh, power your house or, you know, your business or whatever. All right, that's why we use AC. But reason I got into all of that is because I am plugged into the grid. If the grid goes down, I lose power. Amen. But I don't go directly to the power station or the substation, plug in there and run some long electrical cord to my house. No, the power company does that for me, and I paid them a whole lot of money here in New York for a per kilowatt hour to do it for me. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. We who live here in New York pay a whole lot to, for them to do that. All right. And the reason I got into all of that is because your gift, amen, even though it's for the glory of God, your gift is used at the local church, and the local church is where you plug in. What I'm trying to say, and the reason I went through all of that about the electricity and all of that, is that, yes, to a degree, we are plugged in directly to God. We have to get saved, and we get filled with the Holy Spirit, amen. But how does God do it? We we're in the um, uh, 10th chapter of the book of, um, of Acts. Now, we didn't read this part, but if you go back at the beginning of the 10th chapter, it tells how um, an angel visited Cornelius, and the angel had all the information about salvation, but he told Cornelius to get in touch with the church, to get in touch with Peter. He told them specifically to call for one Simon Peter, who's at the house of Simon the Tanner, 
uh, down by the sea in Joppa. So he told him, now, yeah, the angel knew the information, but the angel didn't tell Cornelius. The angel sent Cornelius to the church. Amen. Those of you who God dealt with you before you got saved. Amen. You got saved at a church or by the church. And the church is not the building. The church is the group of baptized believers in Christ Jesus. In other words, somebody already connected to God had to hook you up. Even if God spoke to you directly or led you directly, he led you to somebody else who was already connected in the kingdom because um, God respects his order. God does not go out of his chain of command. Amen. God set up apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers for the edifying of the church. You know, if you're in the military, one of the worst things you could do, uh, any type of, not even just the military, but the police, the fire, you work in an organization. If you have an immediate supervisor or immediate manager, you want to, you want to, you want to get on the S list with that person. You want to get in trouble with that person. You don't go through them. You go around them or go over their head. You break the chain of command. I was working for a company one time and I did that. I didn't go, my manager didn't give me the answer. I I like, amen, and I went, I didn't just go over his head to his manager, I went to the head of the company, amen, and, you know, me and that manager didn't get along um, very well after that, amen. The rest of the time I was on that job, I had a, a, a tough um, road to hoe. Amen. Because I broke the chain of command. Amen. Glory to God. So God honors his chain of command. He put the church here and we get saved through the church. And praise the Lord. Hope you enjoyed the teaching today. Uh, if you like a copy of today's program, just use the um, contact information that's appeared on your screen. Get in contact with us. Amen. Um, Get in contact with us also if you would like to join us, uh, be a part of a ministry, be a part of this great teaching. Amen. Give us a call and we'll give you the pertinent information about where, when, how, why, and all that good stuff. Amen. If you are not born again, let me invite you to come out of the desert of sin. Amen. Because you're going to die out there. Amen. Glory to God. But Jesus came so that you can have life. If you're tired, if you're sick, sick and tired of living the way you've been living, and uh, getting beat up by the devil, it's easy. Uh, let me change that. It's not easy. Jesus did the hard part. Uh, he left the easy part for us. All you have to do is accept him. Something as simple as saying, Lord Jesus, take my life and do something with it. Something as simple as saying, Lord, I know um, that I'm a sinner and I need help. I can't save myself. I ask you to forgive me. Wash me in your blood. Come into my life and be my Lord. It's as easy as that, my friend. And listen, if that's the decision you've made today, you took the first step on a journey of a thousand miles. You need to be in a good church home. Wherever you are in the United States, you give us a call and we will be able to direct you to a good church in your area. Until next time, this is Pastor Samuel Morris and the Oasis. God bless you.